Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Mubarak. And this is our 12th annual Sisters Ramadan session. And I wanted to think about the number 12, so I looked it up to see the significance of 12. And it says 12 represents fullness and completeness. And I was like, oh, yeah. You know, and there's a lot of reference uh, to 12 biblically. But I like that definition there. We're going to uh, have a great session, inshallah. I know that we will. Uh, we have three different dynamic presenters because our theme is to uh, reveal, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, we learn to recite what Allah has revealed. And the by sub theme was seeking progress through love. We use love as an acronym. And when we contacted our speakers and confirmed that they would present with us, we said that we would let them decide how they wanted to use love. So I think that's one thing that's going to be very interesting. Uh, our first speaker, Sister Mahasan, is a published poet, dynamic sister, but I'm not going to get into all her bio. Sister Lydia will do that. But, so we have that perspective. Sister Kimberly is coming on, and for those of you who know Sister Kimberly or don't, she's a dynamic, dynamic speaker, very energetic, very focused. She uh, just finished the Islamic Leadership Development and Training Program. And then this afternoon, we will have Sister Anissa Dewan, Ustada Anissa Dewan, who will close the, our session up. And then tomorrow, we'll just be here in the afternoon and we'll do Talim because it's open to the community. And the thing, well, there's two things that's really significant about our Sisters Ramadan session is it came in March. And you know, March in Memphis is a big month. And we're also having, of course, Ramadan in March in Memphis. And one of the things we always did at the end of March, uh, Muslims in Memphis, was we did a, a banquet. But of course, since we're fasting, we're not going to do that this year. We did a pre-Ramadan dinner. And if you missed it, it was, you missed it. It was fabulous. It was great. It was wonderful. But we still have some pledge cards available if anybody wants to make a pledge. And whatever amount you, put, you pledge or we give, we will appreciate it in case you missed it. But that's what we did with that. We did a pre-Islamic pre-Ramadan pre dinner. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's anything pre-Islamic. <laughs> I'm glad it was, I wasn't around. Okay, so Sister Lydia, I would like you to come up and to please introduce our speaker. I didn't, and please forgive me, make copies of the program but there is a poster. This is what I did. There's a big poster in the hallway. I see somebody else did it too. I took a picture of it so that I would have it on the screen and I could follow along with it. I know sometimes I, I kind of like to know what's coming. So if you want to, you know, do that. Just take a picture of it and you can see, you know, what we're going, what we're going to be doing and how the schedule's going to go and when we're going to break and everything. But Sister uh, Lydia, uh, to please come up and introduce our first presenter. What's that? I'm talking about that. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Very Rahman Rahim. Hajim Mahasin Shamsuddin accepted Al Islam under the leadership of Imam Wardabi Muhammad in 1975, two months before fasting her very first Ramadan. Since then, she has been one of his lifelong students and a lifelong student of al Quran after taking her first Arabic class in 1977. She is a native, of a native of Memphis, and after being away for 50 years, she and her family members returned to their home city. She is a published poet, writer, soloist, and an avid quilter. Welcome to the podium, Sister Mahasin Chapman. Thank 
will wait for my sisters and Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Mubarak. Until last Saturday, I had no idea that I would be a presenter. And then she got booked me on the Booked me on the sorry, because I'm a new member on the blog. And I didn't expect this, but some of my sisters who must love me or something, they volunteer my services. <laughs> After protesting, I accept it. But I have a habit of protesting whenever someone wants me to do something because I don't feel that I'm maybe capable of whatever, having doubts or whatever. I welcome this opportunity. So, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I'm going to start out with a poem. Um, Okay. I'm sorry, y'all tell me if you can hear better. Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay, yes. okay just a second. Yeah, I think I must have lost it. I want to start out with. Just a second. Okay. Maybe I wasn't supposed to read that. Yeah, so I know where it is. I think I left it on the table. <laughs> Look on the back side of the table, you can just sit down, the mask paper on the, put some writing on the back side. Yeah. Lashes, no, it's not that one. Lashes, you can hold it. Okay, let me put on my glasses, perhaps I can see a little better. Okay, I found it. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to read you the title, I'm just going to start in so you guys can see where I'm coming from. When I was born, I was colored. Years later, I was Negro. In between, I was called the word. I turned around one day and I was black. Years later, I was Afro-American. When it was discovered that that was hair, I then became African-American. <laughs> Going through the Muslim movement, I became Bilalian. But not many people knew what that was. So once again, I went back to being black. Sometimes black American, most times African American. Now they want to call me people of color. Coming around full circle to calling us colored people again. I was taught by Imam Waristin Muhammad, Waristin Muhammad to watch the language that some people want to shove off on us. So I absolutely refuse to be colored again. Okay. So uh, let me see. How many can I read? So I know this can relate to a lot of sisters in here. Haja. 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 Haja, Haja, Haja. Oh, what a beautiful word to your ears. You will hear them all over as you walk through the land of Arabia. Haja, Haja, Haja. Here you are. Allah has chosen you to come to the holy city of Mecca for him, to adore him, to praise him, to submit your whole self to him. As you walk along, you hear all around you, Haja, 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 Haja. They're talking about you. They're talking about your soul. Your soul that was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your soul that chose to answer the call to make Hajj. You have prepared for this moment for so long. In your dreams, your thoughts, your heart, in your soul, and now you're finally here. Haja, 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 Haja. Such beautiful words. They sound so good to your ears. As you stroll along doing your shopping, you hear it. As you're going to the masjid to pray, you hear it all over the place. Haja, 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 haja. You hear it in this historical place where Abraham built the Kaaba, destroyed over 300 idols there, brought his wife Haja and son there to establish a new community. That's here today. The place where Haja ran back and forth to find water for her child, who dug a spring that is here today. You will get the chance to run those very same steps, back and forth, back and forth. Haja, 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 Haja. Wait a minute, I'm about to have a moment. The memory comes back. 
and that's 40 years ago. How amazing this moment is for you. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can go over to the Kaaba where Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed the black stone, led the big hajj after winning over all the disbelievers in all of Arabia. You can walk around just like he did, drink from the well of Zamzam just like he did, throw stones at Shaitan just like he did, and millions of Muslims from all around the world. Haja, Allah called you. And you answered the call. And when he calls you, and you, and you, you will answer the call to Haja, 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 Haja. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing everyone's Haj. Okay. I'm going to read this one. I'm going to read two more. Then I'm finished, inshallah. When I pray, see, the God I pray to has no partners or daughters or sons. He created all the prophets from Adam to Jesus and Muhammad was the last one. For you to tell me to pray to one of his creations is the highest form of blasphemy. See, I respect your belief, and I need you to respect mine. For in my book it says that there is only one divine, and God will judge us according to each of our books at the end of time. You say I can't get into heaven unless I bow and pray to Jesus? But what about Prophet Abraham, who prayed only to God before there was Jesus? What about Prophet Moses, who brought the word to the people who in the wilderness for 40 years tried, born many years before Jesus, and believed in only the one God? Is God going to send all his creatures to hell who prayed to him before one of his creations was born? What kind of God would he be if he says pray and worship only me? Then he punishes us for not praying to someone who is not even a deity. What you need to understand is the truth about what happened to your book. Some of the truths were distorted by long ago religious truths. God said, God said, however, subhanAllah, God said, have no other gods but me. Jesus prayed to him only, just like me and you. So why should I pray to Jesus when he had to pray to God too? God sent to us his holy prophets with books from different groups of people over different periods of time. He sent to us the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran, and they all say God is only one. Think about it. God is only one. He has no partners, no daughters, no sons. It is so very clear to me to pray, is, to, pray to more than one God or man is total blasphemy. Okay, one last one, then I'm finished. Okay. Nurturing our sacred connections. We are here nurturing, returning to our sacred connections. You, sister, who are hurting, we hurt with you and we cry with you. Your soul is our soul. All our strengths and weaknesses are woven together through the wonders that makes us women who have traveled through different walks of life but whose paths are the same. The nurturing sister of the mind, the body, and the soul who teaches us to eat of the good foods of life. The laying on hand sister who heals the body of its aches and pains. The spiritual minded sister who the spiritual minded sister who lays on that chaotic rapture for the soul. We are for real sisters, connecting in tents of steam to cleanse our minds, our souls, our hearts, our bodies, praying together, connected, weaving souls into one common thread that 
bond that ties us as Muslims, answering to the call of that sacred connection, weaving a quilt of love, strength, sisterhood, weaving our sacred connection, the guiding light of our sisterhood, the hope for our tomorrows and the ones coming behind us. We be some bad sisters, awakening, arising, pulling ourselves up, guiding each other to the truth and the light, to the healing of our souls, on a path of return to our sacred, I'm sorry, on a path of return to nurturing our sacred connections, our path to the one, the supreme nurturer, our true sacred connection. Thank you very much, sisters. I appreciate your time. May Allah bless all of us. Allah Allah Okay. Do you have any, any anybody have any questions? Any discussion? Any comments? <laughs> yes, Sister Rosie. Well, I I first want to thank you for those beautiful points that you shared with us. You're welcome. And the thing that I have, I really would like to know is what inspired you to write the one main question? Uh, uh, okay, there is a group in LA, and uh, thank you. They call the Hot Sisters or something to that effect. So the, the sister formed the group. And collect, we collect supplies for sisters who plan on going to Hajj and help them go to Hajj, things of that nature. So we were having Zoom meetings during, uh, you know, during the COVID virus, and so um, we were on the meeting, and all of a sudden that just it hit me, and I just started writing right there and then, and then I read it to them. You know, so that inspired me to write that. When you say hide your hide, what brought to my mind is when you're on high, mm -hmm. they're telling you get out the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what they were, why they were telling us that, but everywhere we went, they were hide your 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 and I think we started going in 77. Mm -hmm. So they still were under custom of seeing African Americans from America. Right. So they were so glad to see that the, 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 you know, the, the African sisters from America. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Africa. But she left it Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So going back, I had two. I like, I like two of them. I like all of them, but the two that stuck to me were the Haja with that white um, poem and the sister Holy just read. Yeah. And um, you know, we talk about on that the sisterhood, um, Muslim love and love. She said, you don't see you know, the light in How is that to be manifested? You know, um, in the community in the Ummah. Well, what, that poem was inspired uh, in 1990. No, I'm sorry. The first one was in 1990. This was in 2013. The sisters in Northern California, all matter of fact, it was sisters from different states. They formed a committee and they were going to sponsor this retreat in the mountains of Northern California. And that was the things of nurturing our sacred connections. So when I read about tents, what happened? The sisters got into tents here. You know, they were a steam room, whatever, and you can steam up. You can walk around the woods and it's full of bears. <laughs> we thought it was so fun, but they were, they were in the bear. So different things. One, they had sisters there who, who, who were holistic healers, okay. and they would, you know, they would, they would give you massages or things of that nature, put certain oils on you, healing oils or things of that nature. So, oh, uh, there were a couple of them. The healing mind sister was kind of like she was get deep into your, your brain and you know bring out your thoughts, and you, you know, and to heal you what your thoughts are, what's bothering mm -hmm. you, that sort of thing like that. So. Uh, so we're basically there as for sisterhood to strengthen our bonds, you know, 
So that's what inspired that poem. So I wrote it while I was there, and I read it while I was there. Again. So, so what we can do is sit and suggest, uh, matter of fact, remember Zakia El Amin, may Allah be peace with her? Yes. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not that. Zakia Muhammad, I, I read a, a, a poem that she wrote just the other day that she wrote years ago. It was in the, in the Muslim Journal. And she was just talking about how we can be sisters, just be kind to one another, mistake one another, and you know we do that sort of thing like that. It's, it's Muslims, you know, because we are about you know serving Allah subhanahu wa taala. And she was saying that you know your husband should be safe with us, your children should be safe. That sort of thing, just respect each other's boundaries. Right. And, you know, that's how we can do better Muslims. So alhamdulillah, I don't see that problem here, so we're doing okay, right? <laughs> Okay. So how do you supposed to make that a lot with our younger generation? Well, because you know, with all the things that's happening yeah. in the world, they get distracted. Yeah, I'm really not an expert, but all I can say is when at the time we became Muslims, we were young. I know I was in my early twenties, and we were we were happy to be Muslims to get off the streets or whatever. And I think, but one thing Imam Muhammad, the Alaji people have said is that um, this world has a greater putting on our children, you know, because everything is peer pressure, the rap music, all of that stuff like that. I think if we were to have more events and put them out front, you know, things that appeal to them. Like I remember back in the day, we had things like gong shows. You know, remember that, you know, different things that involve them to let them see that we're, we're Muslims, but we're also human, and we like to have a good time, too. You know, and just uh, talk to them more about our life and the life outside, make a comparison, and, and don't try to force them, you know, just offer it to them as a piece of pie on a plate or something like that, you know. Make it look beautiful, because when I came in, it looked good to me, you know, and I was happy to be a Muslim, you know, and I was around a lot of older sisters, you know, and you hear what they had to say and you respected them. Like, they were kind of like a model for me, you know, to be a young Muslim in America. You know, it was totally different. I, like, like she said, I came in two months before Ramadan and I had to fast, like, you know, no food, no drink, sun up sun. but I did it, you know, and at the time, I didn't have a Quran because since we were just changing over to, you know, true Islam, the Quran was short, you know, and I brought my Quran to this brother named Brother, or brother um, William. He was one of the brothers who was shot when they, the police shot the Nazis back in 1972, I think it was. And he was in cruel care bound. So he had a store, and I bought my first Quran from him, and it was on order for two weeks. So the, uh, Ramadan was half over by the time I got it. But I finished it all through Ramadan. Two weeks I finished my Quran, Alhamdulillah. First time reading one, Alhamdulillah, I finished it. So, you know, you have to make it seem exciting to the young people. You know, say, hey, it's good to be alive in this world, but you have to put Islam first. You know, no matter what goes on out there, because we were faced with the same challenges they were as young people. But myself personally, I chose the line that I had crossed over to. You know, still kind of, you know, we still kind of like, you know, it was not overnight. You still kind of, you know, did a little partying, but it was with the Muslims because uh, his one brother, he, he had a place where the Muslims could go and dance, you know, things of that nature. We were not there with the alcohol or whatever, you know, so you just have to make it look appealing to them, you know, make it seem exciting. You know, we had fashion shows, you know, I was one of the models, I used to model all the time, you know, and, you know, Things like that have to bring the world outside in here with a halal manner. That's all I can say. Like I said, I'm not an expert. Okay? I saw like. Well, I think about the last. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, it's not like that. I don't know if anyone's told you, but you're scheduled to attend 45. So. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I saw that. I saw that. Okay. So why are you trying to run away? <laughs> because you guys are looking at me and asking now, questions. Now, with all the knowledge that we just didn't pick presenters haphazardly. Mm -hmm. Okay. We picked them because of their qualifications and their knowledge and what you were going to be able to share with us. 
And you have shared. Oh, it's awesome. I'm so glad it's being reported. But stop trying to get a word. Okay, so we're going to ask you a question. Can you all use the mic? Because we're recording. We need a mic. Oh, you need the microphone because we're recording. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, good. Maybe that's. We didn't need to be here. We're going to let everybody think it just flowed. Okay. I'm sorry. I saw only like, <laughs> I enjoyed all of those poems. Humbly that. So, um, what benefit uh, do do you receive uh, from the development uh, and the expression of your poetry? My personal benefit. Well, um, I've never had that question put before me, but um, I guess I just enjoy writing. You know, I, a lot of my poetry is uh, some, of, some of it my experiences, and some of it are other people's experiences. And I observe it, but I write it in the first person, mm -hmm. you know, because it brings it closer to home, you know, because I re remember brother like, well, I wrote about something, uh, particularly about uh, a lady who stopped, stopped believing in Allah, so found about the Allah. So I wrote it in the I form. And he's like, why would you write something like that? And I didn't really feel like explaining to him how poor she goes, because like he was a singer. I felt that he should understand that, you know, it's not all personal. It's about humanity, humanity you know. So I just kind of just like sometimes it's a, it's a tension reliever, you know, just uh, to, to write it. I started writing when I was a kid. I started out writing um, short stories to my parents, and they ended up being long stories, and I never could put an end to them. So I think that's kind of when I kind of switched over to poetry mostly, you know, because I can do that and just whatever, you know. But. It relieves stress. You want your stressful times, like in college, things of that nature, and you just kind of just start writing and see things happen in life, and you know, just just write. You know, so that's you know, it's, a, it's basically a, a feeling of just fulfilling the need of what I see in life or what I feel in life. That's Alhamdulillah. It so it's it's kind of therapeutic. Therapeutic, yes, you okay. can say that. And and with that being said. I think someone asked, you know, about our uh, our children now. Would this be, would this be something that would be helpful? Not necessarily to all of them, because all of them might not be disposed to doing something like like this. But there may be some uh, some young people who would like, who would like to try to write mm -hmm. and express themselves on paper. Uh, that's true, but if you're trying to around the block, <laughs> around the block, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yes. I see where you're coming, but it would be helpful. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know, writing is one of the strong. This pen is very powerful. Yes. it's very powerful. Yeah, that would be a good way. Back, back to the other question with the people about the young people. That's a good way also to kind of bring them more into the community and out of those, the, out of the world, you know, yeah. So there are, uh, like, this video over there, she's a, she's a poet, mm -hmm. so um, if you are trying to recruit me for this job, <laughs> <laughs> see, <Well. laughs> You know, I'm a backseat person, you know, like, but these people down here, this master of movement, they like to just have people doing stuff, you know. <laughs> if you're going to recruit me for this job, since Lydia was one of the people responsible for recruiting me to be up here today, then if I'm getting recruited for this job, she's going to be recruited with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just a comment. Uh, earlier this morning, when our sister Denise was here for the Holocaust session, mm -hmm. and we were talking about children, and she was saying, and it just struck me because it's wonderful. She was saying 
the Arabic word darba means to strike. And that striking is not like a beating. Mm -hmm. It is the knowledge that you're striking them with. Mm -hmm. You're putting something on their mind to make them think. Mm -hmm. And when you was talking about, you know, when we came into the nation of Islam, we were young. Mm -hmm. It's because we heard something that struck our intellect. It made us think about what kind of life did we really want for ourselves. You know, I know that's what it did to me. Mm -hmm. And that's what turned me to this dean. Because I wanted to see, what is this? What is this? I mean, I wanted to gain some of this knowledge. And when I word, heard the Imam Warth and Muhammad, I thought, oh my God, I gotta get to more of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, but I think the way we reach our young people is we do have to utilize that word and strike their intellect. We really do. We have to touch them at the intellect. Mm -hmm. Because they have minds for a reason, just like we. But we sometimes treat them as if they don't know how to think. They're just children. But we all have in mind, we all have the capacity and the ability to use it. Because that's what God gave it to us for. Okay, very, very, thank you. Very true. I like that. That's the word they use to beat yeah. the woman up in the yeah. Quran. But that's, that's the, that's the um, meaning that they chose. It has yeah. at least 30 some odd meanings, mm -hmm. that word. You know, what they, you know, people with their basic understanding of how life was back then, especially, they just chose them. So I'm going to use that word. To, I know Khalila has some questions for me. No, I, Thank you very much. Khalila. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just enjoyed it and it's interesting. Alhamdulillah. Hey, this is me, Hodge. Can you hear me? I need you to talk into the microphone. Assalamu alaikum. That's how, that's how we close it and have just sisters. Nobody has to be shy or sit in the back seat. Or. No, I just wanted to say that I'm alive. I really enjoyed everything when you spoke about Hajj and Hajj. I, I felt that I was part of the group. It was just, we were there. It, it, in the reality of, we were there. And we were Hajj. So that's how I, that's how I, that word affected me, mm -hmm. that we were all sisters. Can you imagine all the women that were there? Mm -hmm. So we were all one system of unity from everywhere. We didn't know each other, countries, couldn't speak the language, but we were all the same. I just so, I just so, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. And I like the idea of the poetry for the youth because a lot of children have a lot that's going on in their minds and they can't express it. And poetry is a way of being sometimes abstract for them. They don't even know that they're letting it, like you say, it's relieving a lot of anxiety and confusion because they, they are confused right now. And if we can incorporate Islam in that to help them you know, like you say, you have to make it exciting. You have to make the pie on the plate uh, enticing. And so that may all, I, 